I'm the co-founder and CEO of BotSquare, where we are working on the new kind of user interactions using webcams for devices, be it laptops, TV, tablets, iPhones, iPad. Uh, I'll talk briefly about that towards the end. Uh, before that, uh, what we really want to cover here is how to find objects in images, and we are talking about people, car, motorbikes, and all these kind of different objects you can think of. And this is, was more or less a joint work, which, I, which was done with Bill Triggs and Cordelia Schmidt during my PhD thesis time at INRIA in Grenoble, France. Uh, before I start, I'd like to uh, just to understand, uh, given that we have a diverse background, uh, uh, like hey, how many people ha have experience in machine learning algorithms, for example, support vector machines, boostings, and how many people have experience in image processing as such, so that I can try to balance the, uh, the structure of the talk on the two aspects. So machine learning, SVM boosting, okay, I have, I would say about 60%, and from image processing point of view, Okay, we have about 60% again. So uh, if there is a question, feel free to jump in and I'll be happy to answer at that time. I'm afraid that the talk would cover more in details about the image processing rather than the machine learning aspects of it. But at the relevant points, I'll just ask you to think of it as a black box, which more or less typically you have several implementations out in the wild on the web to just download and try it out. The goal and challenge in computer vision is basically, the holy grail is if you can detect and find objects in images. The problem there is that uh, if you just look at one category, which is people, right? There's a huge amount of variation in the poses. I can be in all these different poses, side pose, side back pose. You have variation in the clothing from summers on the beach to the winters in the uh, snowstorm. You have complex backgrounds, indoor, outdoors, and different kind of lightings coming in, and you have an issue of the scale. Uh, and you have an issue of the image scale, wherein hey, people might be at really small, or they can be really zoomed in. And what we want to do is detect objects under all these different scenarios, just from a single, given a single image, and if time permits, I'll talk about how we can do it over videos in a much more precise way. Uh, this was done in the, 2003, at that time, the state of art wasn't really there as such. That is, people detection or car detection wasn't really working reliably. So uh, the reason I'm still covering is that many, much of this work is still very relevant today. It's in some sense the state of the art in detecting objects in images. And uh, there are several different variants which have come up since publication of my thesis. Uh, I'll have a one slide over there, and this would be on the web someone told me, so you can find details in there, and if there is a question, feel free to uh, send me an email. So here is a video of what you want to do. This is, uh, for the purpose of this video, we just detected people, like fully visible people, and this runs on a frame-by-frame -frame basis. There is no tracking information whatsoever, so every frame is treated individually in this video. And you can see that here we are trying to find people. Here is a snowstorm case, someone with an umbrella, which is very different kind of lightings, and you have the snowflakes falling. And this is all running on MPEG-4 video quality. So this is not uncompressed, like full resolution or full detail images. These are really have JPEG artifacts. Here you would see there are some false positives, but you would also see the system is very, very robust to different kind of lightings, even when you're turning off the lights and you have all these different cases. Like I said, it's detecting fully visible people. You would find that as people get fully visible and beyond a certain scale, the system would start detecting. So if they're walking towards, I would say from the left side, you would see as they walk, as their scale becomes bigger, the system would start detecting these people. And look at the variation in the clothing already and in the environment and the scene. Side pose, people with skirts, dresses, so all those conditions are there. Really low lighting, but there are issues around the boundaries, but as soon as people are just above the boundary, it's like, hey, it kind of detects people. We can hardly see in many cases, like, hey, people are really even there, but system just works. So this is state of art in 2005 summer. It has improved much more since then, and I'll probably not go in the details, but I'll definitely point out pointers towards those work. 
I'll just skip the video. So, uh, the area more or less got jump started uh, in late 1990s with the work on Har wavelets, which are these kind of uh, blocks you can see, which not, not, does nothing but sums all the pixel intensities over this region and subtract it by this region. And then you have a single scalar value over an image region. And now you can just give it to, oops, my bad. You can give it to support vector machine, which was done in uh, like 2000, or uh, Viola and Jones improved it by adding in Ada Boost, and they added several different modifications. I'll cover some of them briefly. Uh, so this was working very well system for face detection, but as you go to articulated objects like people or motorbikes, the system started failing, and the improvement really went later on in terms of how you can make robust systems for generic object detectors. There was also a work by Gavrila et al. in 1998, if, if I recall it right, for using edge templates. So you have people, you would have them edge templates of the people for detecting pedestrians for a smart car. This was mainly for Mercedes and uh, BMW kind of research project. They work decently well for pedestrians on the road, but as soon as you take the same approach and apply it to generic image detection, it didn't really work that well. Uh, the, there are several different approaches you can do in here in terms of edge fragments detections. Uh, I'll just skip those details to keep it simple. Uh, starting in 2001, 2003, key point based approaches started picking up. When I say key point, what it really means is that you have an image, you figure out what is the most characteristic elements of these images. For example, in here, all the corners you can think of it, it's treating them as some kind of characteristic. This is the two consecutive frames of the video sequence. And it's detecting all these corners pretty well. And these are the kind of algorithms which you find uh, commonly used in Google goggles and any of these image detection or let's say image matching algorithms. But when you apply it to object detection, in this case for finding people in the images, you find that from one frame to next frame, these key points don't occur anymore. For example, there are no key points here on the arm, right? The problem there is that, hey, humans don't necessarily, because of the articulation in there, the repeatability of these key points changes and it's not present anymore. And so that's why people tried doing these kind of things in 2004, five. It worked well, but not really improved the state of art by a huge margin. So, what really worked, and this is lots of experience, I think is really, really simple system. So the system st starts by, you have an image, let's say this is this big bounding box here, the lowest uh, level of the pyramid. You put a detection window on this image, and this is of the fixed sized. Detection window does not, the size of this window doesn't change. It can be, let's say, 64 by 64 pixels or whatever. And you scan all possible locations at this scale in the image. Then you change the scale, uh, reduce the image size, and then scan all of these locations again. Every time when you're scanning this thing, you extract some features. You give those features to a learning algorithm. This can be a support vector machine, so linear support vector machine in this case, or it can be a boosting based uh, framework. And if your system is good, you would find multiple such of these detections. The final system just combines these different detections and give you a result. So this is what was proposed in face detection in by Viola and Johns in 1990, in 2001, and even before that. Uh, and the same system worked rather than this kind of more complicated where you where people try to figure out the parts. Only when uh, in the community we figured out how to best extract the features from an image, people went and built robust part detectors, which are currently state of art right now. So I'll start by talking about face detection in images. The core idea there is to um, give a notion of like how you can design really using really, really simple algorithms, a robust face detector, and then we'll go to detecting people. Uh, this is uh, work of Viola and Johns in 2001. This is a seminal work in computer vision. It's part of OpenCV implementations of face detection, and it's basically uh, HAR features and the 
system is training is slightly slower, but detection is very, very fast. It's a real time in 2003 and four. So it's a really rapid system. And there are some of the key aspects of it we'll cover in here. So this is how it works. Mm -hmm. Given that you have a bounding box here over an image region, let's say in this case it's a face, the system actually b puts these kind of small sub-windows over th within this big bounding box. And in each case, what it does is it sums up all the regions in this white area and subtract it from this black area. So it's just a scalar value for each sub-window. Or if you have the RGB colors, you can do the same thing over three channels and get a vector. The, you can think of a simple example in here. Uh, by the way, this was uh, taken from some slide. Uh, I should have started it. I just did it early in the morning. So, uh, mm. so you see here, like, hey, if the image is a simple white noise here, this more or less would give you a zero output. But if this window is placed at the right location on the face, that is, let's say, on the eyes and on the cheeks here, it would give you some kind of signal. What you really do in such a framework is take several of these weak learners, these are, because it's not really robust. It, it can have quite much noise. But even if this is just above 50% accuracy, then you can use this system to build a robust uh, face detector. And this is what, uh, what the work was. The, there are two key problems. Uh, think of it this way. If you have to come sum all these regions, and there can be several of such weak learners over a simple face detector, you have to do a lot of computation, and this not really is optimal. So what uh, they recommended is computing something they call integral images for fast speed up. The concept is very, very simple. In an integral image, at any given location, x and y, the value is the sum of all the pixels in this region. Really, really simple. It's just like integrating over a two-dimension space. So, and this can be computed really, really fast in just one loop over the image. Let's say you have an integral image computed till this location in the image. Then you do a cumulative sum of this row. And the end thing is nothing but this the very last pixel of this cumulative sum, this pixel, and the one pixel above here. So in just three operations, you can compute this integral image for every single pixel. So it's just three n if n is the number of pixels in an image operation. So it's a linear in time. What it does allow you to do is now, given any rectangle over the image, any rectangle over the image, you can compute the sum over this rectangle by simply summing the value in here at this A, subtracting this B and C from there. If you do that, you'd subtract the region from the D twice, so you add the D again. So in just three operations, you can compute the sum over this region, another three operations to compute the sum over this region. You subtract them. In overall seven operations, you have a feature value for this sub-window. Here is an example. right? And now what you essentially do is you take several of these sub-regions. You can have different shapes the way you can think of. For example, in this case, it's trying to figure out a, a horizontal edge. Right? If the edge is right in here, you would get a high signal here. This kind of thing is looking for some kind of a bar detector. Right? If you have a high signal here, but low signals on these black sides, you get some kind of high, uh, high, high bar detector. Um, here you have 45 degree oriented gradients, uh, like along the diagonal axis, another 90 degree to this thing. So you can think of several of these different shapes, but there are quite many combinations like in here. And the overall system was like, hey, how can you, instead of detecting all these rectangles or all these different combinations, how you can figure out the most relevant one from uh, these number of possibilities? And this is what is done through a boosting. Boosting is a kind of machine learning algorithm in which you have these weak learners. All of these give you one scalar. So all you need is for any of these things, um, so uh, I think I should have talked about it earlier. So before you go and train such a system, you need to have positive images. That is, you need to have a label data in which you would mark the bounding boxes over the people faces. You call this as your positive training data. And you need to have a negative data set, which can be any random images you can find on the web, which does not have people or faces in it, simple. 
Once you have this data and this bounding box is over these things, you can put these kind of boxes over these positive windows and figure out what's the value. And you can put these kind of sub windows at several different locations over the negative images because you know in your negative images you don't have face, so you can pick any different regions. So you just randomly sample those regions. And this way you can build just by probably looking at, let's say, the scalar value of this sub window and see that, hey, if it is greater than some threshold, yeah, maybe I have a positive uh, face in there. If it is less than that threshold, maybe I don't have a face in there. So each of these can be used to build a really uh, lots of weak learners. And the boosting framework allows you to do is it learns, picks these weak learners and create a, a robust classifier out of that. Uh, so each weak learner needs to do only better than a chance. And training consists of multiple boosts. So let me, we can think of it this way. So initially, for each window, uh, let's say positive window, you give them some equal weight. You don't like, hey, positive window some weight, negative window some weight. Then in each boosting round, you figure out the one weak learner which gives you the best performance right now. Okay. Whatever windows have been misclassified, when I'm, and when I say windows, these are positive windows and the negative windows. So for one window and positive windows, would, in case, would be just a rectangular box on the people's faces. Negative windows would be any region over the image. So you, so you find the misclassified windows, and you increase their weight. And finally, as you keep doing multiple iterations of this thing, you can have a final classifier which combines all these weak learners. And as it combines these weak learners, every time the system has to outperform the previous, uh, previous round of the boosting. So it gets better and better as you add more and more features. The well exact formulas and weightings, it's, there's a lot of different approaches. Uh, but what it allows you to do is you have a very fast uh, feature evaluation method because you only pick at every stage in the boosting frameworks. You may pick, for example, 100, 200, 500, 1,000 sub-windows. But each window is essentially just seven, eight, or nine operations. So it's really, really fast to compute. Uh, it uses all those different image sub-windows within a window. So you can, it just picks the most relevant locations. For example, in a face, you might have one sub-window here on the eyes, another one on the lips, another one on the nose, maybe somewhere around the nose, uh, around the ears. Then be, you may want to capture the hairline here, so you can have something dark, something light here, and vice versa. So it picks all of these small sub-windows within a window, and it builds a robust classifier out of it. There is one drawback, which is slow training time which is not really such a big drawback because once you have trained the system, it's really, really fast, and it's the test time performance which really matters in all of the systems. Uh, but the, the drawback is that hard features, like these very simple, they are very coarse. They are really simply just computing the differences over a small region, right? They don't have any fine details whatsoever in them. The second drawback is you miss texture, shape, uh, there is no normalization concept. What happens if the light turns off? Then the thresholds which you have put on your weak learners are very, very different. And it doesn't work for articulated objects or even for things like motorbikes because there is such a huge variation in them. So uh, we propose this uh, new kind of features for extracting um, for extracting uh, so new kind of feature extraction from images, mainly for people, but later on extended to all kind of different kind of objects and found that empirically founded that it works very well for different kind of objects. So the concept here is, hey, this is my overall image, and this is a small detection window in this image. So this. In this case, for people detection, it's about 64 pixels wide and 128 pixels long. So given a lot of training data, in this case, we used about 3,000 images of people marked. We marked this kind of box, bounding boxes over these people. And you can see this is just one image here, right, where you have a person right in the center. It can be any pose as long as the person is fully visible here. So these kind of images, they form our positive images. And we have any random images over the web, which we treated as our negative images. One can 
optionally normalize the image. For example, one gamma normalization can be you take the square root of the image intensities, or you can just even take its log. It depends upon what kind of uh, what kind of image features, what what kind of image is it? It is right for visual information image. It doesn't really matter if you take the gamma normalization or not. Features does it pretty well. Next, we compute image gradients. Uh, I'll talk about how we compute these gradients later. So what these gradients allow us to do is for every gradient you have uh, these kind of magnitudes uh, of the gradient, but you also have the orientation of the gradient. So what we then do is we create, we take this window and we split this window into such a dense grid. In each grid we have these cells, right, all these different cells. In each cell we take a pixel intensity sorry, pixel gradient, we figure out its orientation and magnitude. We create a histogram of orientation in this cell and weight that histogram by the magnitude of the gradient. So we are really creating histograms of gradients, orientations, of gradient orientations, and that's why we call it histogram of oriented gradients. Uh, for example, in this case, you can think of, hey, maybe you create eight bins over zero to 180 degrees. And for each bin, we, for every pixel in the cell, we take the magnitude and we look for which orientation bin as per the, uh, which orientation bin as per the gradient orientation, this magnitude should go to and just add that magnitude in that orientation bin. Next, we combine several of these cells in the neighborhood to create a block. Block allows us to normalize the image or normalize that block. This provides us contrast normalization. So you can imagine if you turn off the light and if there is some visible light so that you are capturing some kind of graded information, this normalization takes, gets rid of that change in the light in, or image intensity. You can have several of these overlapping blocks and you can collect, we call histogram of oriented gradients over detection windows, like all of these blocks, and we put them one after another after another in a big feature vector. Now, you can use a learning algorithm. For example, in this case, we used uh, linear support vector machines, which is very, very common uh, learning algorithm, as a black box, and we give these feature vectors. While we give these feature vectors, we also tell them, for this window, we are expecting a person, so we give a label of one. Here is a window, here is a computed feature vector with a label of one. Similarly, we do it for all positive images, and then we do it for all negative windows like this computed over negative images, and we give it to this linear SVM in one shot. It takes all of that data, positive ones with the plus one label, negative ones with the minus one label, and figures out that, hey, every time I get this kind of feature vector, it tells you something. Did I see a person or not? So it really is a data-driven algorithm in which you just collect a bunch of data. You have a fixed way of computing features and give it to a linear SVM, and it learns over them. So this is how the overall system looks like. So first, we create fixed resolution normalized training data set. So like I said, in this case, we picked uh, the normalized means every window would be 64 by 128 and person would be more or less normalized in the right in the center of this window. So it's a lot of manual work to get done there. You do it the same thing over lots of negative images in which you just need one criteria. There should not be not a single person fully visible and upright. And you can collect any small sample of this image at any given scale as long as it's of the fixed resolution. We encode these images into features. So when I say feature, it's, I'm talking about this kind of a computation machinery which com creates, takes this image window and computes this mathematical vector here. We learn it a binary classifier which can now give in any such window and the feature associated with that window tells you, hey, did I see a person or did I not see a person? Once you have this, you are pretty much, you already have a system. But it turns out this system is not a robust system. It doesn't work that well. What you do then is you go back to this original, all the training images, but now you are only looking at the negative images because negative images is really hard to collect. It's, sorry, it's really easy to collect. You look at an image and you can say oh, there is no person in it. Okay, part of negative image. Oh, there is a person. I'll probably mark that person in that image or I'll just prune that image out. 
you resample all the possible locations you can think of over this negative window by doing a really, really dense scan at every location and every scale. And you encode all these windows that you scanned into feature spaces. So it's a lot of work. And if you run this uh, classifier, this one, the one you learned here previously, and see, did you get a positive or negative? If you get a positive class, but this is only over negative images, so you can't really have any positive class here. You pick those windows and add it back to the training data here. And you re relearn a new classifier. So just so this is called, a, it's like a, a boosting in some sense, right? Or bootstrapping process. And it significantly reduces the number of mislabels or misdetections by the system. Now, when I talked about this process of all these things, I assume a lot of things like, hey, you would compute image gradients. I didn't talk about how would we compute image gradients. I didn't talk about, hey, how many bins we need to have and how do we exactly vote, what kind of structures these cells need to have. This is, in this case, it's a square structure, right? But there is nothing which says you need to have a square structure. You can have rectangular, circular, and all these different kind of shapes here. And why you want to combine things like this, and even, for example, in this case, this cell is being repeated in two blocks, one here and one here. So it's, there is a duplication of the information. But what is different is, so each block, which is this block here, it has a different normalization. So what is different is the normalization is different. And how does that help, and why do that? So there are a lot of uh, experiments which were encoded in this thing. So now let's look at why do certain things and what is the impact of those things on the system performance. So the first one is when we're computing image gradient, what kind of gradients we need to use, how many orientation bins one would like to use, what percentage of block overlap is good. In here, it's one-fourth of a block overlap is present. Then what kind of color space one should work on? What kind of normalization? I talked about, hey, we take the feature vectors over this block and normalize it. What do we mean by that? What you can do is you can sum up all the feature vectors in that uh, thing, take its uh, sum of squared, um, so, uh, take its L2 norm, which is like just square all the feature vectors and sum them up and normalize it. Or you can do something like L1 norm, but then take its square root. So you have several different schemes and things you can cook off. And the question is, how does all these different things impact the performance? In here, you, why just go with a rectangular thing? Why not just go for something like circular, right? So there was no set standard on all these things. And we figured out, like, hey, let's go and empirically test each of these things, one after another after another, in a very systematic way, and let the data guide us. So with this approach, we created, we looked at the existing data set, which was at that time collected in 1999, and it had people in front and back poses like this on the streets. And if you can take this each image and compute its gradient and average it, this is the kind of shape you get. So you see like, hey, people head, shoulders is pretty well marked out, but their arms tends to blur out. So this kind of image actually turns out is very, very helpful because it tells you what kind of data you have and how well the data is normalized. The better the data is normalized, the better it is, but you would have certain inherent variations in those images and you would see certain regions would be invariably blurred. So this data wasn't too big and very quickly we realized that, hey, this is the scheme we cooked up here, it just, gave perfect result. Like there was not even a single false detection in this thing. And in, whenever you are in this kind of conditions in the machine learning paradigm, you know that, hey, your data is too simple for the problem. So you go and collect a bigger data set, which is what I did. A lot of personal photographs and photographs from the friends marked each one of these photographs and we created like decently big data set of about um, 1,000 positive images and about 500 negative images. But each of these images, you can flop them. You can just take their mirror along the vertical axis, and you can double your data. So we did that, and now I'll talk about the performance. So I'll just talk about the general performance first, and then go in a systematic way about each of the parameters that I talked earlier, and how that change, changed the performance. And what we are really, really looking for is, it's not one thing which impacts the whole system, 
It's sum of all the small details which allows you to create a best system. The good side is, after I'll talk about all these things, I'll show how it extends to other classes. And uh, in the thesis and in other works, you would see that, hey, the paradigm is the same. Most of the parameters are also the same. So it's really, it scales really, really well for different object categories. So this thing, the magenta curve here, which you can see, I think, in here. This is the Haar wavelet, which was the then best detector. We added certain things to it, like normalizations and overlapping blocks and cells. So we gave it quite some advantage. This was the, so this is on a log scale. Here we are looking at uh, false positives per window. What does that mean? Essentially, uh, uh, maybe, uh, okay, let me go very quickly back. So when we are running these windows over all these different locations, in a typical image, you get about 10,000, 200,000 windows that you would sample. Typical image being 640 by 480 pixel image. And if you have much bigger, it just, it just is a quadratic. Problem. Uh, the number of windows you would detect would increase quadratically. So there are a lot many windows. Now, there might be one, two, or multiple people, but quite often you won't see a person in an image or you won't see your class category in a general statistics. So you are looking for a system which should do, like if, even if you were to have one false detection over 10 images, if you are just assuming 10,000 windows are being sampled in just one image, you are looking for a system which should ha just give you one false positive in every one in 100,000 windows, right? So you are really, really looking for a really good system or detector uh, if you just look at the number of windows you compare. So with that idea in mind, with that idea in mind, this one is number of false positives per window that is in a log scale. So at 10 e to the power minus 4, I have one false positive every 10,000 windows. At 10 e to the power minus 5, we are looking at one false positive in every 100,000 windows, and so on and so forth. So you want uh, really less number of false positives, so you want to be somewhere in this 10 e to the power minus 4, 5, or even 10 e to the power minus 6 numbers. On the y-axis, you have miss rate, that is how often there was a detection, there was a person present in the image in this case, and you misdetected it, and you missed the person. So this is also on a log scale here, okay? So we can see that, hey, this is the performance we have is about 98% accurate at 10 to power minus five, and if we just put in our system, we got like, I think it was 100% results here, and only 10 to power minus six, we got just one error here out of those 500, 600 examples. So, and the only difference between this and these things is the how fine resolution the features had. We gave it all the other advantages, which I'll talk about in terms of the cells and the blocks and the normalization and everything was same. It's just that the hard features are too coarse for several of the existing object detection challenges that community has. So this is the result on our person data set. We can see a high resolution version here. This is the hard wavelet feature here. Again, everything is same except that the features are hard wavelets. Here we have our features. So this is our typical curve here. Uh, one can think of 10 e to the power minus 4. This is, this is almost about 10,000 windows per image. So it gives you about one false positive per image you are looking at what kind of performance you can get. So if, I, if I'm ready to tolerate one false positive per image, this system was 90% accurate. Whereas our fish system was about only 75 to 60% accurate here. So it's a huge difference because it's on a log scale. Or you can think of from this to this, you are talking about almost, this is one order of magnitude, this is another half of it. So about 50 times performance change. So how did we achieve all of that? First one is the gradient smoothing. 
You can compute image gradients in a several way. The typical way people recommend is you put a Gaussian kernel, which has more or less a shape like this. Uh, then you take the difference, you convolve that image with the Gaussian kernel, and you look at the image gradients, which is dx and dy, which can be computed by a really simple, let's see, I don't have it here, which can be computed by a really simple minus one, zero, plus one operator along the x, and the same operator along the y axis. Okay, so it's like these are three different pixel values. Uh, you can increase the Gaussian sigma, and we found out that, hey, so till, till that point, there were people were using a lot of smoothing because the common notion was, you have an image, image is a digital process, it's a digital image, and in order to get a nice gradient out of it, you need to smooth the image because of the inherent noise in the digitalization. This was probably the case in early 90s, but by 2001, 2003, it wasn't the case anymore. All the images, you found that you, you can just sim put a simple minus one zero, uh, minus one zero plus one gradient operator without smoothing image at all. So sigma equal to zero is that kernel, and as you increase sigma, you are increasing the bandwidth of the Gaussian, that is, you are summing over a bigger and bigger image region. And we found that as you smooth more, the performance starts from here and starts dropping off. At about this thing, you are almost about, I think, 20 times performance difference. And this is huge. So just if you smooth more, you lose performance. And this was very different result from everything which was done till that time. So basically, you don't want to smooth your images anymore. Your images are more or less good. The second thing we found was, how many bins should we have? In case of our features, there were about, we went from all the way from three bins to nine bins, 16 bins. So when you're computing image gradients, so let's say you put a minus one, zero, plus one operator, and you put the same operator vertically, you can compute arc tangent, right? Now this typically would be from zero to uh, 360 degrees, or you can have it as unsigned system in which you have the values from 0 to pi, 0 to 180 degrees. So this is what it covers here, 0 to 180 degrees and 0 to 360 degrees. Which one of them to pick depends upon your object class. I'll talk about that in a minute. So we found that, hey, you want to have fine enough details. In this case, anything around nine bins per, nine bins in the histogram to about 12, eight bins is what you minimum need. As you decrease the number of bins, your performance again starts from here and you start losing the performance. So all these curves here are about, you can say, hey, three to four bins is what you have. Now, just between this and these two parameters, which is the amount of smoothing and the orientation bins, you would find that the Haar wavelet has lost. Haar wavelets were, there was a big chunk of the image region, subwindow. You sum everything inside that and subtract it with the one subwindow next to it. That is, you have a really, really big smoothing window, in this case, just summation over everything and subtracting it from everything. So 10x performance loss here. Another thing you have is there is no orientation information except for very crude vertical orientations or horizontal, vertical, and maybe 45 degree orientation. So that's amount to just about four bins here. So again, you have lost about 10x. So the, the hard wavelets were really, really coarse for most of the object detection challenges you have. They work really well for face detections because face is a structured object. Your eyes are not moving with respect to each other, right? They are fixed. Similarly, your location of your nose, mouth is fixed relative to each other. So it works really well, but for articulated objects, for motorbikes, cars, they tend to fail. Next thing was, why normalize an image? So, well, the answer is in here. If you don't normalize at all, this is where you are. At 10 to the power minus four, you're talking about one order of difference, second order of difference, a performance of 100 times. 100 times, just if you do one thing wrong, not normalize an image. So you have to normalize an image, and we found that you can pick any of these different schemes. The top three of them are more or less equally good. The first one is, well, let's talk, talk about this one, L2 norm. It's nothing but whatever the feature vector is, you square it up and sum it up and divide it, you have an L2 norm. This one is L2 hysteresis, which was made popular by David Lowe from uh, University of British Columbia 
in his feature vector SIFT, S-I-F-T, which is a very, very popular and seminal work in the computer vision, where experimentally he found that you have a feature vector, you compute its L2 norm, and then you clip off all the dimensions which are greater than 0 0.2 to 0 0.2, and then renormalize it. Really simple hysteresis threshold, and it works extremely well, and it's still being used by many people. What we thought of this as, we're like, hey, these are histograms. What kind of distances you can compute over histograms? And one of the distances is Bhattacharya coefficient, which is nothing but every dimension of the histogram, you take its square root and you multiply it. It's like a cosine of square, uh, cosine of square root of normalized histograms. So you take your histogram, normalize it so that its sum is equal to one. You take the square root of each dimension and you take their cosine. And this is what is being represented here, L1 square root. L1 means, means sum, is, sum of the histogram is one. So you take its square root and you use that as a normalization factor. This has no hysteresis. It has a very neat meaning. That is, all the histograms, you are finding dissimilarity because the histograms are normalized. So the dot product is nothing but uh, similarity between these histograms over a unit hyperplane. And it works extremely well. L1 norm is somewhere in here. So if you just norm L1, because images are, changes in the image intensity is not linear. Depending up, if as you change lighting, the image intensity changes are not linear. So L1 norm doesn't do that well, and which you can see in here. And this is consistent with several different other experiments that people have run. And of course, if you have no normalization in here, there is one more experiment which we did, which was here window norm. Instead of normalizing each blocks, remember I had a window, and within window there are several blocks. If you just normalize the whole window, you are somewhere in here. So there is still is a difference of about two to three x. Remember, this is on a log scale. So this is about three x performance difference. And the main reason for that is quite often, if you're looking at something like, let's say people, part of the person can be in the shade, part of it can be in the sun. So until unless you have a local normalization, which is working on all these different regions, you would not get the same performance as if you just normalize the whole window in one shot. In terms of the block overlaps, uh, we tried several different things. We tried no overlap at all here, in which the, each cell is being contributed in only one block, versus uh, overlap of one fourth, and here overlap of uh, three fourths. So basically, you can think of it as in terms of area. Uh, hold on, this is half in terms of area, this is even more. Yeah, so this is almost about 75%, I guess. Uh, so as you increase the overlap, the performance keeps improving. Very slightly, this is about 2x to 1x, uh, like 100% to 200% change here, another 50 to 60%. So at some point, the system would saturate, but some overlap is definite, definitely helpful. What's the potential reason for that? Uh, Mm. I'll, I'll come to that in a minute, okay? So before one goes there, hey, so we took these different cells. What should be the size of the cells? And how many cells should we have in each block? And what we did was we like, hey, without any bias, just let's just compute, just, let's just empirically compute it. So we varied cell sizes over here. Like these are one cell per block, not two cells per block, three cells per block, four cells per block and here number of pixels in each cell. And as we varied, we built the whole system and tested its performance. And we found that there is a nice sweet spot in here for this particular data set when we had three by three uh, cells per block and each cell was of about six pixels. And when we put overlaid that block here on this image, we found something very, very interesting. That the each cell size, which is this small box here, was more or less the same as the size of the human limb, okay? And the size of the block was more or less about two to three different limbs in some sense. That is allowed you for some kind of variation in those limbs. So it's just that there are, 
it's not really any random number you can think of, it's lot based upon your data. So if you just take your data and compute these kind of images, you can get a lot of good clues about what kind of parameters you need to tune in. But till now, overall, more or less, in almost all cases, if you have this big of a window size, 64 by 128, 6 pixels or 8 pixel white cells and 2 by 2 number of cells per block or 3 by 3 as in this case number of cells per block work more or less fine across different object categories. And if you reduce it to let's say 32 by 32 which is typical face detector size, you just half these numbers. Then on your, because then at that point you are looking for the eyes, nose and mouth and you can just estimate how many, what's the width of the eyes and nose in that small image. So till date, this was a very top-down approach. You have, you designed a system, you thought of a system, you built the system, you ran different experiments, and you figured out certain results. Now the question is why it is working the way it was working. For that, we did uh, bottom-up analysis. Here's an input image. We computed average gradients on that. So. For our learning system, we used linear SVM. Linear SVM is a class of learning algorithms which just can separate, which, which can give you really, really good results if your data is really, really separated between positive class and negative class and there is a clean separation between the two. The reason we used such a simple learning algorithm was that we wanted to ensure that we wanted to build the right feature extraction methods for our problem. So on purpose, we kept a simple linear algorithm, simple learning algorithm, but made more and more robust and focused on the feature vector so that we know that any improvement or performance gain we get, we get it from our feature, from the changes in our feature vectors rather than applying a more sophisticated learning algorithm. And once you have the right feature sets, if you want better performance, you can just put in more sophisticated learning algorithms and get even better results. So, if you take the linear SVM, it has every, it, 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 it is just a feature vector of the same length as your input feature vector plus one extra bias term depending upon if you are interested in the bias. You can just, we just plotted the positive weights in there and we plotted it in terms of our histograms orientation. So each of this line here corresponds to the cell and the dominant orientation or, or the, in that cell and the magnitude of this line is equal to the magnitude of this weight here. And similarly in here. If you look carefully, you would find that positive weights is looking for people's head in multiple orientations, right? It's like one head here, another head here. Shoulders, some kind of vertical gradients here, and more importantly about this kind of shading at, the, at where the feet touches the ground. In case of negative weights, it's looking for a right, this vertical column in the center, and of course there are some variations around. So in some sense, it's looking for this kind of shape as long as the gradient, the vertical gradients doesn't run along in the center of the person. So it will detect this kind of shapes, but if it is a tree with a long vertical gradient all through it, it would say no, it's not a person. So it's really, really simple system. Now, if you think of it, this was about 3,000 dimensions. So in just 3,000 dimensions or about 3 kilobytes of the data, you build a system which, is, which gives you one false positive in here in every 10,000 windows with 90% accuracy in just 3 kilobytes of data. That's impressive. <laughs> and this is a simple linear system. So that's the kind of the tuning you have in there and that's the power of the feature vectors in here. Another thing we learned by looking more closely at this data is most of the time, if your block is somewhere like this, which is just outside the person's silhouette, that has the most weight. So in some sense, if you're looking for people, it's not important what's inside, but it's important what's the context around the people really, really crucial information, at least for people detection, and this is not the same for heads. For example, if you put the same system on a face, and if this is just your bounding box around the face, then it would work decently well. If you can capture the hairline and everything and some context around it, the system performance would increase more. So the context helps a lot, 
And there are other works since then which use this clue, well, it seems kind of obvious that, hey, context helps, and they have built on top of the context even more. So the question is that are we looking at just the outline in here or the information around the background in here? We are, we don't really have this outline marked out for us in the training data. So all we are looking for is the statistics of where the outlines are in the images. What is the most consistent gradients and the shapes in the images? Typically, as you would see here, you would have a very sharp edges around where the statistics match, but after that, it would be all about averaged out. Yeah? So if you were looking at Santa Claus with his bright stripe down the middle and a very wide beard, mm -hmm. it would be hard to recognize. Maybe, right? But you also have to, yes, yeah, so let, let me repeat the question. The question was, uh, if you're looking at a Santa Claus with a white beard which goes in here and there's a bright streak in the center, which may be from the coats and the jackets, it would be hard to detect. The answer is maybe, but we also have to consider the fact that people have coats and jackets in our database. So it may still detect it. The white beard does, hi does hide all of these issues in here. So system is much more robust than we typically tend to think. And it can be made more robust by, so this is just one set of features we talked about, right? It can be made more robust by adding more and more kind of features. Uh, till now, uh, what we covered is, given an image, we build a detector which, on a small portion of the image, it extracts features and tells you, did I see this object or not? The whole focus was, hey, my object is, my detector is really, really great. It just is really great. If this is really true, one would imagine that if I'm standing here and if I shift slightly, the system should still perform more or less the same. And if that's the case, you would, as you scan the images at multiple scales, you would find multiple overlapping detections here. So, in order to build a final system, one would like to use this information. And for example, here you have one detection on this bike, and one would like to con use this information, hey, I have multiple detections, I want to, there's a more stronger chance of having a person here and here, and less of a chance of finding a person here. So how do you use this information? You have an SVM score, linear SVM in our case, so it just is uh, number from minus infinity to positive infinity. Typically it varies from, depending upon the normalization between minus five to positive five and whatever the variation is. You can clip off and say that all the numbers which are less than zero is negative, which is more or less reasonable. For positive detections, you typically tend to get plus one scores. For good negative detections, you typically tend to get minus one scores. So anything between minus one to positive one is you have, you don't have such a good certainty in your prediction. We put a half a mark in here and everything beyond this thing is now treated as one detection. So all these windows are being plotted for this case when their detection score is greater than zero. Each of these detections can then be represented in a three-dimensional space. One is X and Y, which is the center of this bounding box, which we detected. And the third dimension is the scale. At what scale was this bounding box fired or we found a positive detection? So we have a three-dimensional space each of these boxes is now a point in this three-dimensional space. What one can do is there is a class of algorithms called mean shift algorithms for clustering. So you want to cluster all of these data points. The advantage of the mean shift clustering is it's a algorithm where you don't have to specify the number of clusters. You have to specify certain parameters, which is amount of smoothing. You specify that and if for, you can start from any detection, which is any point, all of these are, remember, points in this three-dimensional space, you can start from any point. It, if you compute the gradient, uh, compute the gradient of this, uh, these points, which are represented as kernel density estimators, I'm, I'm just giving you some 
uh, terms here. So for those of uh, who are aware of the mean shift, it would be easier. But if not, then you can just look for the mean shift or send me an email later. So each of these points are represented as uh, densities here in this 3D space. And we are looking for the center of the clusters. And this can be done in a gradient descent approach, which points out all these different clusters. And once you have the clusters, you also know what is the strength of that cluster, or you know its peak. It would be much higher peak for this than this case, and just really small peak for this case, because there is just one detection supporting that cluster. So you just put a threshold on that, and you can get rid of these kind of singular detections very, very easily. So uh, here is an example. So we took this image and run this kind of 64 by 128 pixel, which is just right size for this girl here, at every single pixel on this image, at this scale, which just matches to this scale. And this is the kind of detections we get. So you would see it has a very, very strong prominent detection here in the center, right in the center of the girl. And it tends to taper off very easily. So we use this information. Like you can see, if you run a right mean shift cluster, you can find this point very, very easily. And this is in a log space also, by the way. So overall, uh, you can create a precision recall curve, which typically shows you recall here on the x-axis means how many people did we recall right out of the total number of people in the data set. And of the people we found, how many of them were correct? And in here, you are better off if you are towards this end of the curve. And we varied all these different parameters. Uh, in this algorithm, there are some smoothing parameters. I won't go in the details here. And you can use these parameters to figure out, hey, you are somewhere in, which is a pretty good detector, which this is 2005 state of art, right? So it's like, hey, at 60% recall, that uh, when you're detecting 60% of the people, you found 90% of the people correctly using just one feature in a single image, any given image to the system. There are some more parameters. All of these parameters turn out more or less to be very, very stable. You can, the finer sampling you do when you compute, when you're looking for the, when you're running your detection window at different scales, the fine sampling you do, the better your system is. Typically, you are better off at about 1.05 variation between two different scale levels. This is the ratio of the scale levels, two consecutive scale levels, two between 1.10. 1.05 is more or less you are already good there. So it's like tends to saturate over here. And we ran several different versions of the algorithms. One would tend to think that, hey, instead of having this knee jerk clipping here, why won't I convert it to through a logistic regression into some kind of probability space? We tried that, and it turns out it gives you so many more detections. And lots of those detections are simply plain noise, right? Because once you convert it to through a logistic regression, everything is a probability. Everything is a probability of whether finding a person or not. So there are lots of other windows, even though they have very, very small probability, they tend to pollute this uh, non-maximum suppression algorithm that I talked about in here. So a simple knee-jerk kind of clipping works best in here. So this was done in 2005. Since then, there was a lot of work which used different learning algorithms, changed from, in our case, linear SVM to ADA boosting. There were works which used different features. They put in more sophisticated learning algorithms based upon kernel SVMs. This was work done by Dollar et al. from UCSD in 2009. And they found that even though the systems were good in terms of individual windows, these kind of curves, these, these curves are for each individual window, right? And these curves are for the overall detections over the images post this non-maximum suppression operation. Their overall performance still wasn't good after you do the non-maximum suppression. So this is our system in here. In, on these results, this is false positives per image. You're better off if you're towards this end of the curve. So the whole system is not just you, you design the best features, but it also what you do post detections and how you merge those multiple detections. Like I said, 
This is an extremely powerful information that if your detector fires, it would tend to fire in a cluster. And you have to use this information in a reliable way to build a better system. So this is the same initial videos. Uh, I will just skip over here. So we are about 8.15. So conclusion still now. Uh, there was a lot of small changes in the work, and that's what made it really state of the art since then. And in some sense, we improved the performance over state of art by almost about 100 times in one publication. The key factors which improved, which really re helped us get that kind of performance is first is the gradient smoothing. Smoothing when computing gradients is bad. Given images are already high quality, you are better off in using one zero minus one kind of derivative masks. And people have repeated this experiment again and again for object categories like cars, motorbikes, cows, horses, you name it, more or less the same conclusion. Number of orientation bins, you want to have fine bins in orientations, anything between eight bins from zero to 180 degree, if the orientation is unsigned, that is from zero to 180 degree, you want to use about eight bins, nine bins, 12 bins. If you are going over the signed space, which is zero to 360 degrees, you just do exit. So it's about how fine the sampling you have of your image gradients, which is important. And once you have this fine kind of shape information, you do have to compute histograms over a small eight by eight pixels or six by six pixels, depending upon your detection window size. That binning of image gradients into histograms over the, which has a spatial extent of the cell, allows you the invariance to the small shifts within the cell. If there is an, let's say if my face is here, if I just move very slightly, it won't change the histogram so much. And this kind of uh, invariance is important to detect images, or to detect objects in images. I haven't talked about, but if you threshold your gradient, it hurts. And the primary reason for that is very, very hard to come up with one universal threshold which would work across different illumination changes in the images. So you are better off in whatever magnitude you have in the image gradients and use that magnitude in the histogram voting. Normalization is extremely important. It's a very, very simple step. Immediately gives you huge performance gain. And if you have overlapping blocks, that's also helpful. And last but not least is it's the overall system, so all parts of the system needs to work well. It's like a car, right? So if there is something wrong in the transmission, the car won't work. Similarly, everything needs to fit together, and to have a robust non-maximum suppression is also very important. There was one drawback of the whole approach, that is in 2004 and five, it was much slower than integral images. Currently, the system is, you have real-time implementations, and many of those improvements and games come from algorithmic changes rather than the processing speed. So this is real-time implementation is feasible. Part of the reason for that is, uh, well, it's too back, so I won't go back. The feature vectors, just when you talked about the processing over each detection window, you don't have to process, you have, don't have to recompute features over each windows. You can compute the cells over a particular scale on the image, compute the histograms for these cells over the whole scale, at that scale in one shot, and then just like you, we talked about integral image over uh, when we computed the hard features, you can have an integral histogram also, where you first compute uh, eight dimension histogram for each pixel, and then you have, let's say you have eight bins in that pixel, you have eight images. You can compute integral images over all of these different uh, orientations individually, and that way you can now compute the histogram over any region in a constant time. So there are tricks which uh, are vis uh, I'll, I'll point out in the paper, which uh, not in this, in this in the deck, um, which you can use to do it faster. So this thing worked not only for people but also for different object classes. Here we gave it car images, and we just mark this kind of rectangular box in the car. The car has a funny problem, which is between the front and the side views, the aspect ratio of the box changes a lot. We didn't do any of any kind of 
post-processing or something. We just marked the tight bounding box around the car and gave it to the system. So even when it is like something like this, it, use, it gives some kind of information here, but it worked really, really well. For motorbikes, horses, just to name a few, currently the system is being used for sheep, cows, bikes, bicycles, which is like really, really thin objects. And people have improved it a lot. Yes, so does it outperform hard features on the faces? I'm not sure if someone ever tried that. Uh, face detector works decently well. Uh, but uh, one can be definitely sure that it would definitely not be subpar compared to the hard, fee, hard features. Most likely it should perform better. Nobody ever tried it. Problem which is solved, hey, why go and attack that again? So next idea is on finding people in videos. I'll just talk about very briefly the con key concept there and jump over the details. So I'll play a video on to the hairs. Let's see if it works. Come on. Ah. Okay, oh yeah, I remember. We don't have the video because we moved the PPT from one machine to another machine. So the key idea was that human motion is very, very characteristic. In this video, this is very, very famous video. Just these blobs move and you know what action the user is doing. Is he running, playing tennis, or like any kind of dancing? Just by these blobs, which each of these blobs represents different points, one can figure out the motion the person is doing. So it's very, very unique and characteristic, and one would want to use this kind of motion. The problem is, typically, we don't have these blobs well pointed out, mark well for us, just except in Kinect these days. And how would you use? if you don't have this kind of information to build a system which still uses the video information or in the, which still uses the information which is present in the video to build even more robust detector. And the requirements there is that such a system should work irrespective of camera is moving or not. If the camera moves, it creates some other motion in the background. And it would also work if uh, the background moves, a car moving in the background or something. So you have to adjust for all of these kind of changes. Uh, well, uh, I'll skip this thing. What we did was something very similar to what I talked about in terms of the images, but extended it to the two consecutive frames. So there is one which is the image information. This is just the motion part of it. If you have these two consecutive frames, you can compute optical flow field, which is slow to compute, but you can compute it. Once you have that information, you have the magnitude of the flow, and you also have the direction of the flow. So this, just like you compute the derivative of an image, which gives you dx and dy, this is a vector information, which is 2D information. And the flow here would be, you would have a four-dimensional vector here. You can compute the the differential over the x, differential over the y, or you can just compute the differential over this magnitude and treat the orientation separately. This flow orientation can now be used to create, just like in histograms, in, in the original image case, we computed histograms using the image gradient. Now you can compute histograms using the direction of the flow. The problem there is you have to do it in a very coarse bins, rather than eight bins, you have to go to much lower bins because flow computation is a noisy process rather than image gradients. It's much more noisy. So you can't have that many number of orientation bins. You are better off in doing four bins or three bins because more the number of bins, since the signal is not precise, you tend to lose performance because the information gets spread out. Maybe that can be countered by adding more and more data set, but if your data set is limited, you are better off in small number of coarse images. And the whole system was just like a static image thing. You compute a motion information, collect it on one single big feature vector, give it to a S linear SVM as a black box, and you get a detector. Uh, let's skip the details. Now, there are two key things which we put up here. The first one was, uh, you can think of several different ways of doing these things. The first one is that you want, may want to capture the motion boundaries here, which if this is the magnitude and this is my difference over the 
x flow. So for here I have the estimated flow which has a dx and dy signal. If I compute the gradient of this flow individually as x signal and y signal, this is the kind of images I get. So people tend to move horizontally a lot more and much less vertically, right? So you can use this information. Now you have two images. You can create two separate, just like these two images you have uh, for each of these flow fields, you have the x and uh, orientation and the magnitude. You can just use the same processing chain and it works decent, but this is not what we want because this kind of information is already present in our static image case also. This is repeat information in some sense. What we really want to capture is how different limbs move with respect to each other. Right? And if you have that information, then you have really characteristic human motion detector. The best way to do it is to know about all this presence of different limbs first. That's the ideal case. And once you have this information, you can see how legs are moving with respect to the head. But you don't have this information because if you already know this is the head and legs, your problem is solved. Right? What you can do is you can create a system in which for you look at fixed block and you see how the flow changes for every pixel in this one cell with respect to every pixels in its neighborhood. And if you do it uh, with enough data and with the decent, like this kind of system, so here I'm looking for a, whatever, how the pixels worked in this thing with respect to this and how they change from this to this. And if you do these operations over these different schemes, you can think of, now these are nothing but hard wavelets kind of schemes. But we are doing pixel level differences from one every pixel in this cell to every pixel in this cell. And as we take those differences, we have the orientations of those differences. So you can capture within a small block, in this case three by three block, how two different cells move with respect to each other. And you can use that information to capture motion. One can now think of it, there are quite many combinations you can do here. So you, in principle, you can have a boosting kind of framework, just like in face detector, where you would say, hey, I don't want to pre-supply you these different schemes. There are these hundred and thousand possible schemes. Just figure out the best one which work for you. But it's a slow algorithm because comp what you are doing is you are first computing the, um, you first have to figure out for each of these such combinations, which one of them is the best at every stage in the boosting and computing the flow information is also very, very intensive even now. It's, it's just on a graphics card, you can do it such a thing in real time. But it is feasible if you have enough computation, you can build a really robust detector for finding moving human in the images. So we tried several different flows. I'll skip the details here. So like here you can see, just these two small differences between two consecutive frames and how these flow informations are there. When we found this more, bit more regularized, unregularized flow works better. And in terms of the difference, so this is the original case MBH, which I talked about in here, which is nothing but takes the X and Y flow field separately and combines them. And the second is the internal motion histograms where we look for the internal motions within the cells. As it turns out, this MBH I'll talk about in here, which is the start in here. This is here on its own, nothing but the MBH, which is the static information, right? Just, just the motion information. And this is just off by a factor of 10 from the static image detector. So this information is not bad on its own. It's pretty good. But when you combine the two, uh, we would see in the next, yeah. So when you combine the two, this is where you are. It doesn't change anything. You remain more or less the stock. Whereas if you use this IMH variance, there are several different versions here. This one, this blue curve jumped from IMH on its own is this, but as soon as you combine it with the static image detector, which is this, uh, this curve. Uh, no, the static hog is, oh, no, no, sorry, it's, it's not in here. So. As soon as you combine it with the static appearance, it comes out to the best detector better than any of these two individually. So it's really the complementary information which really helps when you combine these different features. And what I talked about here is the shape feature. So if you combine them with the color features, which is hard to do, colors should not be typically touched because lighting illumination changes them a lot, but there are ways you can do it right. Or texture information, you can just improve the system performance by adding more features. So this is the combination. So here is the static detector on its own. 
as soon as you add the video information you get another 15 uh, like another 50 times kind of performance gain so i'll this was on a different data sets very different data sets this has like just different characteristics uh, so this was collected over the same bunch of movies hollywood movies we collected videos out of that video clips uh, part of them, those clips at different shots becomes training and some very different shots from the same movies become our test data set. This is the performance. And then we collected some more videos, like, which were very, very different videos, people dancing and these kind of things. So results stay more or less the same. It's just that the magnitude of the difference changes. And if you have more data, much more data, you can do much better job. Uh, I'll so this was used by, in a recent system, uh, this kind of combinations where static image appearance, this kind of uh, motion features with a uh, different kind of a learning algorithm to get really, really good results for smart cars while people walking on the street for smart cars. So overall is that, hey, internal motion histograms is what you want to really look for uh, when detecting people in the moving things, and this works pretty well even on the compressed videos in MPEG-4 kind of videos. You don't want to use the MPEG-4 block matching schemes because that just hurts performance. It's too coarse. You need to have pixel level flow information for this kind of system to work well. Flow needs to be treated uh, slightly more carefully because it's noisy input. It's not as clear input as an image is. So you need to have much coarser histograms. But again, normalization, because it's noise, is very, very important. And having an extra strong normalization doesn't hurt in this case. So the details are there in my PhD thesis. Overall, what I talked about here is just a bottoms up approach, which is we don't care about what's the context of the image, who is what, where the image source came from. All we're caring about is, hey, we built a single window detector and how good a detector can be built, which if this detector can give us one false, nothing more than one false positive in every single million windows, you can build an overall system, which is very, very good. It may still give you one false positive every 10 minutes on a video stream, but it is pretty good just based upon static image appearances. And if you can add domain specific constraints, for example, in a security surveillance, you can maybe use background subtraction information to do something better or if you have an extra channel in case of Kinect, you have the depth information, it would just help your system do even better job. So there are several extensions. Uh, people did all kinds of things. Make it, first, thing, first goal was to make it real time, which was done like the next year itself. Then someone used it at a boost. Next year in itself, we published in CVPR 2005, CVPR 2006 was done in at a boost. Part-based detectors. We didn't talk about detecting heads and all these things, which was done. This is still is some, some sense state of art right now. But all the features and the methodology is the same, but it just added more complexity. If you know about the locations of different parts, you can do much better job because you allowed for the variations of the part, which we didn't allow in our fixed system. Motion information, uh, people used it and learning new learning algorithms. And people also put like a higher analysis in which you have the context information available. So uh, currently what we are doing, so this is uh, what we have is, uh, we are working on a next generation user interface using simple webcams you have in laptops, iPads, and iPhones. Um, can I have the audio? I'll just go to the... For years, we've known just one way to interact with computers. Isn't it time we move beyond keyboard and mouse? Take online movies, for instance. Meet Brad. Brad loves to watch movies on his laptop, but hates to go back to his keyboard to play, pause, and control volume. Well, now he has a new way. At BotSquare, we're working to make your interaction with computers easier. Using our gesture recognition software, you can start and stop a movie using a simple flick of your hand. Is the sound too loud? Well, you can change that just as easily. You can flick your fingers to scroll down to your favorite song or adjust the volume, all with just a simple hand gesture. Or flick through your photographs. Wait, what was that again? Here's how this works. 
all you need to do is download BotSquare software. The plug-in will activate the camera, and you can get started on your Friday night movie. These are just a few of our applications. If you have ideas for more, we would love to hear from you. So we would be launching it in the first quarter of the next year. It's already have a working system. It's just adding more and more and making it more precise and robust. We are looking for computer vision and machine learning researchers. If someone is interested, we'll be happy to talk to. And I would say this is the first real-time consumer application which would be able to put forward, which would be in the hands of users working on their webcams without any extra hardware. It would work on your iPads, iPhones also, hopefully. Uh, the hardware is the same. And uh, the work involves a lot of state-of-art research and the engineering in terms of having run times, which is really, really precise, but it just works seamlessly from a user point of view. So with that, I'll stop. If you have a question, feel free to. I, it would be, I was told this would be somewhere on the ACM uh, web, so you can have this information from there. It's also part of the, I gave a lecture on Stanford, so you would probably, if you search for my name, you would find this deck. Yeah. What type of software tools did you use to develop these algorithms? Plus, uh, this was done in 2003, OpenCV wasn't good. Now you have an implementation of the detector in OpenCV. I don't think the training is there, but testing is still there. OpenCV is doing, they are doing a pretty good job in building more and more of these systems. So that's first place to, first place to look for it. So is MATLAB too slow for this? Right now, no. I, the speed, MATLAB would always be slower than standard C++. Uh, that's the, but there are a lot of algorithmic changes. Part of these changes you can look about in here in AWS rejection thing. This is one change. Uh, people have, there are also some speed changes mentioned in here and people have put it on the graphics card here. So MATLAB would be slow. It probably won't be real time, but it would be fine enough. You can get four or five frames per second. That's reasonable enough. So I'm just curious, why did you use C++ instead of MATLAB? Mm, because in 2004 and five, when I was doing this thing, MATLAB was even more slower. So we had about one second, one frame per second system at that time. Um, I, one can say that, hey, MATLAB though is faster to code, but it would always be slower to test. And Having a native system allowed us to run it in massively parallel way on clusters. You can just run it in several different machines at once. When you were discussing your uh, parameter optimization, mm -hmm. and you said you approached it in a systematic manner, mm -hmm. you're kind of assuming that they are independent, and yeah. tweaking one of the parameters doesn't affect mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. That's the assumption. Yeah, so the question is, hey, there are several different parameters and they may not be independent of each other, right? So the part of the answer there, it's quite some slides back, so I'll just skip. There are two parameters which are really dependent upon each other, which is the cell size and the number of cells in the block. Other than that, all other parameters, be it the smoothing, the number of orientation bins, they are capturing very different aspects of the images. And one can reasonably assume that they are independent. We also tried it. We also tried wearing two of them simultaneously and found that there is no correlation in the change of the two. So the two which we found to be correlated were tested together. And that's why that's where we saw that kind of a block, 3D, uh, 3D plot of the error. There are a lot of um, graphics libraries that have APIs, and one of the things that they do is they will take an image and clip a subset of the image, and mm -hmm. they'll also scale the image. Mm -hmm. 
So, and I think that's done with uh, the uh, GPU on most computers these days. Mm -hmm. So for some of these algorithms, it looks like you ought to be able to use the hardware to basically say, take the image, and instead of using C++, you just call the API to grab a subset of the image, and then if you want a histogram of that subset, you scale it to a one by one pixel, and literally within one machine cycle, if, uh, if I understand how the GPUs work, you've got a histogram of that subset of the windows. So for things like Viola Jones, uh -huh. maybe with JavaScript on a, on a web browser, by making heavy use of these graphics manipulations, you don't actually have to go through uh, do loops or for loops to calculate stuff. Maybe I'm wrong. I, I don't know much about GPUs. I, I just know what the APIs are. Yeah. So uh, the question now, let me rephrase it, is that, hey, can we just use the modern architectures, which are GPUs are present there, to scale an image to such that each pixel goes to one core and you can do operations on a single core, right? The way typically GPU works is you have limited uh, RAM in the GPU. So you, you are limited in the GPU domain by the amount of RAM you have available. And the, there are a number of cores, 128 cores. So the bottleneck is not really the, the number of cycles you can do per second, but it's really is how much RAM you have. And if you can limit that RAM consumption, you are better off. So people typically, this is a GPU implementation where people have done. And uh, what they typically do is the algorithm, if you think of it, is uh, massively parallelizable because it's the same operation happening on each pixels in each cells in each case. So you split the image into cells and as long as you, those, each of these cells go in a different GPU core, you are fine and you can do operations very, very quickly on those cores. So the problem there is the RAM, which is much slower than the CPU cycle. This uh, reminds me a lot of uh, Poggio's work at MIT. Um, mm -hmm. Wondered how the, what the difference would be. I mean, he, he gets features of Gabor filters at different orientations. He has the whole pyramid of scales. He votes the pixels, all that. So how, how is yours similar and how is yours different other than you're probably a lot faster than his? Yeah, so the question is with regard to a work which was done in 1998, if I recall it right, on finding peoples, which I saw, show when, you sh when I showed you the images, they were MIT data set and there's the pedestrian data set. So that's the data we are talking about. And the, and the question is, how is it different? The key there was you used hard features with the linear SVM as a system. The problem, the key issue is with the hard features, it's, it's simply two cores for you to find relevant information and the fine details which you can do with these kind of histograms and fine detail histograms in terms of the gradient smoothing because it's just summing up over the small region which even if it is four by four pixel region, you are looking at a Gaussian of about sigma equal to two in some sense. And the second difference is the orientation information is just totally lost. All you have is verticals and maybe 45 degree orientations in the best case scenario. And we added all of those things to those data sets. So the system which I showed you the curve, it was already about 50 times better than the work which was presented in 1998. So the R baseline for the wavelet thing was already 50 times better than the best curves presented by them because we included some of these normalization schemes and capturing uh, information in cells and then using those cells in blocks in our baseline system. So in some sense, the overall system performance compared to the, that kind of algorithm is almost about 500 to 1,000 times better. I may, I may have another question. Is yeah. there, uh, about the motion, de um, motion detection, where you're you analyzing the optical flow, so you said they're analyzing two frames, the existing, fr the current yeah. frame and the previous one. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about extending that, or there is any work extending to the several previous frame, and then you have maybe the vector of the mo of the of the direction, and maybe you can histogram it as you're doing for two dimensions. Or yes. So in the question is, can we extend it from two frames to multiple frames, three frames, four frames, or five frames? The answer is definitely. 
the constraint there is the computational resources. Motion uh, features is being, they are running real time uh, for smart cars as per my last information where people used to make heavy use of multiple GPUs, one for computing optical flow, another for computing all the systems and detection. So you have multiple parallel processings happening and you can use and you have also infrared channels and all these different channels. In As long as it's an image, whatever the spectrum is, it doesn't really matter. You can do a lot of things on that. So this, this kind of system works in there, but the key bottleneck is the speed the runtime speed and also because just the flow takes about one GPU right now, computing it real time. So if you have three frames, uh, even though you can use flow from the previous to the next one, but the amount of data you need to do that kind of learning in a robust way is phenomenal. People would add it if you want to solve an engineering system, a real time car detection system for pedestrians, one should definitely go and do it. There are other informations probably like in Google cars where they use very different spectrum altogether than images to help improve the system. Any other question? Cool. So, yeah, uh, do register to our website if you are interested in the private beta. We would be sending out any. We don't really spam. You won't see a mail from us for three, four months. Okay. You just see one mail saying announcing that, hey, the product is out. You can go and download it right now.